Hello, I'm Andy Martins. Welcome to Civic Affairs. Uh, all shows are special, but this one is a little bit more special. I'm welcoming Jennifer Sarlo, the chair of the Algoma District School Board. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much for doing this and taking out your time out on a busy afternoon. Yes, well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here, and I appreciate the time you've given me. Yeah. No problem. I just thought at the beginning, I, I know your story because you're from my ward, and tell people how you uh, started in uh, education as a trustee and how you ended up by being the chair of the school board uh, today kind of thing. Yeah, well, I, um, I started out uh, in volunteering in my kids' schools and helping out wherever was needed. And uh, between the nursery school and the, the board on the nursery school, I remember being the chair of the board of the nursery school. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then going into school councils and being involved there. And uh, back in 2006, I thought it seemed like a good fit for me to run for school board trustee at that point in time. So. And you, we, we all know, I know the story, and Bill Hall was a legendary trustee, and uh, yes. the opportunity was there, and... Uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, putting yourself forward for public office, as you know, is always uh, risky, and uh, you put yourself out there, but I was um, thankful for the support of the board, and uh, we were successful that first time, and haven't had to run since. I've been acclaimed the last... Wow. Uh, the last after there, that. There, so there, I'm in my fourth term now as trustee. So there's a story to that. Somebody told me last year, Andy, why don't you run for trustee in Ward One? I said, Are you kidding me? I'm not going to run against Jennifer Sarlo. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> but a trustee is important, isn't it? You feel good when you're involved in your parents, uh, your uh, kids' education. You do, and I think it's an important role. And and sometimes I don't think people understand the role. They think, Well, what do we what do we have trustees for? And even when I was out campaigning, they said, well, I don't have kids in the system and I don't, why, you know, I don't pay attention to that stuff anymore. But, um, you know, public education is a foundational, um, mm -hmm. core foundation of our, of our society. And we all need to care about education and, uh, and the ability to provide quality public education to our students is, is a really important thing. So... Um, everyone should care about it. We are fiscally responsible for a lot of money and, uh, you know, a budget about uh, $150 million and um, that runs into our, uh, what we're responsible for and, and so people should care about education right. and about uh, the role of the trustees. So. What were some of the key issues back then when your kids were in uh, public school? I know my kids went to Pinewood and then after we moved to Texas Avenue. Um, what were some of the key issues why you got involved to begin with? Well, I just, I felt like I had something to contribute. I was passionate about public education and I loved what was happening in our schools. And I just wanted to be part of a leadership that could oversee that and, and bring my voice to the table as a parent of uh, two kids in the system. So right. um, at that time, uh, I remember when we started out, there was a big focus and it continues to be a focus, but we really had a refresh of our um, capital plan and looking forward to you know some of our facilities a lot of our facilities were aging our population was declining and how were we going to get the best possible uh, facilities um, mm -hmm. with the dollars we had and uh, you know over the last uh, 12 years we've done a lot of work around the uh, around the capital plan and right sizing our system and we have some beautiful new facilities we have a lot of really refreshed facilities and and good learning environments for our students. Now let's get into today you're a trustee and the chair of the board. You speak for the board and you chair all the um, meetings. How much work and time is involved with all of that per week? Well you know uh, it's, a, it's a great role. I love um, that the board has confidence in me. I think I've been doing it for six years right. now and uh, yeah so I chair the meetings. I preside over those meetings. We set agendas and, um, and I am the spokesperson for the board and as the chair you tend to have a um, pretty consistent communication with our director of education on a regular basis. Um, 
outside of meeting times right. and uh, you sit on a number of committees and things like that so the role sometimes can be you know 25 hours a week and sometimes it can be two right. and so <laughs> yeah. it's uh, and you know I'm really thankful I have um, flex in my schedule to do the right. number of jobs that I um, like to be uh, the different things that I'm involved in so um, being uh, chair of the board gives me leadership opportunities that I really love representing our board. I'm very passionate about the great work that's right. happening every day. And, and so I, I, I love to be that, uh, that face of the board. And you, uh, meaning you're the spokesperson, you deal with all the media inquiries. And yes, I do. Yeah, that's part of my job. Sometimes that's <laughs> great, like today it's and other days it can be challenging. Speaking of which, uh, we were trying to get away from politics and into education, but do you really get away from politics with education? Um, we are talking before the show, it's, uh, it's getting tougher and tougher with this new government to, uh, to uh, all the issues around education. Uh. Yeah, and this this government, when they were uh, elected, they did. You know, we knew that fiscal responsibility was going to be high on their priority list, and that they wanted to bring the the budget into balance. And so we knew that we were going to have some um, financial cons constraints put right. on us. And so. Um, yeah, we've had uh, a couple of announcements lately around what that might look like going forward, but there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. So Great. We'll take a quick break, Jen, and we'll be right back. Sounds good. We'll be right back after these messages on Civic Affairs. Coming to get you, Barbara. Listen to them. Children of the night. It's alive! It's alive! Cozy up this winter with Mio's Furniture Fashions. Add some warmth and comfort to your home with Dimplex Electric Fireplaces. Now 25% off. Save 20 to 30% off Lazy Boys. Sleep easy with a new Sealy Posturepedic, Stearns and Foster, or Tempur-Pedic mattresses and adjustable beds. Now up to 50% off. Shop these and other incredible deals this winter at Mio's Furniture Fashions. Surface before and after the sale. 261 Trunk Road. Where else? discover all kinds of treasures and never pay more than five dollars inventory is restocked every Saturday and you can find anything from electronics to household items toys and much much more on Saturday everything is five dollars and the price goes down throughout the week ending with 25 cents on Friday we restock weekly with new items from various big box stores so you never know what treasures you can find come visit us at quarter to five 2510 Ashman Street in Sault Ste. Marie Michigan Hi, welcome back. Thanks for uh, staying with us. We're chatting with Jennifer Sarlo, the chair of the Algoma District School Board. And Jen, uh, this is a great time to talk about education, the government, and all that the school board has on its hands because we talked before the broadcast that um, the government is now saying that em uh, the board employees need to be frozen. Uh, I, I assume that would include teachers too. And you've got the autism piece coming at you in about a month. Mm -hmm. Give yeah, us some insight. <laughs> yeah, it's never like boring. a juggler juggling <laughs> all these balls. Yeah, and you know, I think the memo from the ministry around hiring was 
that they're asking boards to use prudence right. <laughs> and not saying it's frozen, but you need to recognize that moving ahead, if there are changes in class size that the government is going to put into um, practice or things like that, that we have to be cautious around our hiring. So normally our hiring decisions and notice to has to be put into our, our contracts by at our April 2nd board meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, because of some of the unknowns around um, the government funding and the grants for student needs, we have, um, they're asking you to, to err on the side of caution around you know who who you're going to hire and um, and so you may we may be handing out more pink slips than normal just to be cautious it doesn't right. mean you know that we we won't be hiring these people back in September but um, it's because of the unknowns around the funding we right. we can't make promises we won't be able to keep you think you might move in that direction within 30 days or so or how quickly could that happen well perhaps there will be an extension um, with the contract so that we may not have to give that notice right. um, quite as early as we normally do with the um, funding piece being unknown at this point it's hard to make those decisions but we will be you know our staff will be moving forward with a cautious approach to it to hiring that probably equals frustration among the board the teachers and the parents because the autism piece and all these cuts are coming to a head all mm -hmm. and uh, you know parents are very leery of all this you know well uh, our special education funding never seems to be enough we right. have you know <laughs> our uh, special education needs and our students continues to grow and um, it is always straining our budgets and uh, and we need to provide for um, the classroom in the classroom for these students that are that are in our seats and we want to do our best possible programming and supports for them but it's not always easy and now with this autism announcement around a different way of funding the autism thing uh, what is what is um, happening is it's kind of a cookie cutter approach. Right. right. Like this is every family can will get this much, and but we know that there's um, on the autism spectrum there's a broad range of needs, right. and so we have some really high need students who are currently maybe part time in our classrooms and uh, and more full time in a in an intensive behavior uh, program, and. Um, if this funding is cut, some of these parents will have to make some hard decisions around what they can afford moving forward. And we don't know right now what that's going to look like and when. So mm -hmm. we're not sure if those students will uh, be uh, coming back to our schools full time. And, you know, we don't, we really can say we have, um, you know, our teachers aren't trained in the kind of um, behavior therapy that these students are used to and uh, so it, it's going to be challenging and it's also kind of a cookie cutter and a robbing robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of approach it really leaves the director and staff at the school board in a lurch doesn't it mm -hmm. well it, there's a lot of unknowns around what it's going to look like and how uh, families are going to respond with that with the funding cut announcement well you know, is it a funding cut or just a different way of doing funding? And uh, and really in Sault Ste. Marie, we've always, and in our district, we've had a lot of challenges around providing for mm -hmm. these students already. So mm -hmm. we have one provider that's, um, you know, a qualified to, to deal with intensive behavior therapy for our, for our students. And so, um, Around here, we, we there's right. a shortage already, and now with the lack with the change in funding, we're going to have more challenges. Does the board ask the the, um, the, the does the school board ask the trustees to come up with a strategy how to deal with these two merging problems that are happening with the government wanting to cut funding of employees and then the autism? Does the board have an input into how uh, to come up with a s strategy, how to deal with all of that? Well, through our operations and budget committee, we, we have a subcommittee that um, oversees the budget process. Mm -hmm. So 
um, they come to us in multiple meetings and say this is our you know this is the big asks on the first round and as those if they continue discussions and try to make it all work and in a, uh, provide a balanced budget to us um, you know we see the priorities come to the surface that this is what we want to fund and we look at our strategic plan and our priorities and say you know this budget needs to be aligned with where we want to go forward over the next three to five years and so as trustees we we set that strategic plan and those right. priorities and then we look to the budget um, pieces what what are the priorities and how are we going to fund those priorities well is it possible that you would have to direct the trustees now as a result of the government announcement of coming in late stage to redo, tweak the numbers of the budget because well, of these just, cuts? Yeah, it will take a lot of work. And we just, you know, our last board our board meeting, we talked about what the process looks like right. for our budget going forward. And so we're in those initial stages. And so we're just going to, you know, their education, we, you know, there's only so much money to go around and we always try to do the best we can with the money we've given. So. Have you seen these kind of challenges uh, since you've been on the school board? The way it's quite different this year, isn't it? Well, there's a few challenges coming um, on the backs of each other, which makes it difficult. And uh, and the, the sooner we know what our funding is going to be, the easier that budget process is. And so if that's going to be delayed, then we're dealing with some unknowns. We're dealing with, this is what we would like to be able to do. And when the funding comes, then we'll say, can we do it or can't we? So there is a chance you may have to tweak. And when do, you, when do you expect that funding to come uh, announcement to, uh, well, uh, within sure. 30, 30 days yeah. maybe? Well, they're saying there will be an announcement um, by mid-March with some clear information around that funding but again usually by the end of March we get the grants for student needs announcements and we know what our funding is and then we move forward so puts you in a bit of a interesting challenge but you know what <laughs> there's always challenges it never ends you say hot topics in education and Andy right. it, there's always a hot topic there it is uh, <laughs> we'll take another quick break yeah. and we'll be right back with Jennifer Sarlo the chair of the Algoma District School Board I need a new phone. What do you use your phone for mostly? Work, play. Oh, you mean everything. One that won't run out of battery when Joyce from Accounting is doing The Running Man. Who else wants to see that Running Man demo? The Samsung Galaxy Note 9. It's a great phone with a powerful all-day battery. We've got the best phone for you for a great price. And you can choose your carrier. A little Running Man? Just a little. There. Nice. I hope no one saw that. Ooh. Where was she when I went phone shopping? Have a great business idea but don't know where to start? Need help taking your business to the next level? C2C Business Services can be your guide in navigating the path of entrepreneurship with services ranging from grant funding support, access to service experts, market information, and helping your business adopt new technologies to create and foster a culture of innovation for ongoing success. Call C2C Business Services and let them be your first step in taking your entrepreneurial dreams from concept to commerce. C2C Business Services is a division of the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Center. You do life, we do taxes.
Welcome back to Civic Affairs. We're talking with Jennifer Sarlo, the chair of the Algoma District School Board. And Jen, before the break, we we're talking about qualified teachers. You uh, let our viewers know there, there always is a need for qualified teachers within the system, isn't there? You know what, we used to hear, and there have been times in my uh, tenure as a trustee where we would say, don't go into education, there's not right. enough jobs. And uh, now there are jobs. It's so changed. People, it yeah. has changed. And I think part of it is the two-year um, certification for teachers now. It's not just one year postgraduate. And so um, we have a shortage, believe it or not, of uh, qualified teachers and EAs, so educational assistants and early childhood educators. So um, in our system, we can't fulfill all the needs that we have. So um, it's, it's good to get the word out that uh, if you're considering um, a, a job and you wanted to be a teacher, come back to St. <laughs> Marie and, uh, right. and, and help us out. You know? What about that? I just uh, tweaked me uh, with the, uh, people were frustrated that retired teachers came back into the system. You've heard of that over the years. I've heard and of that. And took the jobs. <laughs> what, what, what can you tell the viewers? What is the current status of these retired teachers wanting to keep working? Yeah, you know, we used to get that complaint more often than we do now. Um, I think in the district, we can't survive without retired teachers on our supply right. list because we need people that that know the job and can come in and fill those needs. If we get a call in uh, Horn Payne or we get a call in Elliott Lake, we need, you know, we get retired teachers um, on our list there. In the city, we have fewer retired teachers um, on our list and, um, and certainly in their contracts, they have a right to come back and work and you know they bring some experience to the table but right. there's certainly less of them than there used to be and um, but you know, we value our retired teachers too because they bring some um, okay. you know, wisdom yeah. and continuity to the system. And as I say, in the district, we couldn't survive without them. Let's switch gears and talk about Coldest Night. And I really want to congratulate you for an excellent event that's a lot of hard work that just finished about a week ago. Yeah. And how much time did it goes into that? And uh, can you maybe give us an insight into poverty in St. Vincent's Place and uh, why Coldest Night is an important event? Yeah, it was a great event. And I was the event director again, um, and I brought this event to Sault Ste. Marie and to St. Vincent Place. We, this was our seventh year doing it. So, but it was our best year yet. Um, we've raised over $84,000 wow. um, locally for St. Vincent Place. and. Uh, you know, um, as a volunteer there, I, I volunteer in the soup kitchen on mm -hmm. Wednesday evenings and right. uh, we prepare and uh, serve a meal to, um, to the public on Wednesday evenings. And uh, I see the work that happens at St. Vincent Place every day and the needs are increasing. Are they, in I was just going to ask you then, Sault Ste. Marie, the needs are increasing. And let's give a shout out to Sarah McCleary. She does a fantastic oh, job. Oh, yeah, there. and she's part of the success of this year's <laughs> event, for she sure. Is. I, I, and I so loved, uh, poverty is not getting better in Sault Ste. Marie right now? Then. Well, it doesn't appear to be. I think maybe we're turning a corner. And I think awareness in the city is also increased around what the needs are and how we can better meet those needs. I think City Council is doing some great work around that. And uh, it was great to have the mayor involved right. in Coldest Night. And he also volunteers at St. Vincent Place. So, right. um, so there's good work being done by a lot of agencies and to help poverty in education, we do, um, you know, we're providing, I always say education is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. And if we can, to get people out of poverty, poverty education is the answer. Right. And uh, we want to graduate those students and um, get them out of that cycle of poverty. That and you see that concerned. poverty issues of Sault Ste. Marie in the schools as well. It starts every there, day. does it not? Every day, yeah. And our teachers see it every day. And, you know, I think our schools do a great job of um, putting resources around our most needy students and, and supporting them. Mm -hmm. I know teachers that 
have uh, you know little bags of food at their desk all the time and they know the kids that need the mittens and uh, and things like that and and so there's a lot that happens behind the scenes but our schools right. also are great places uh, you know we have breakfast programs in so many of our schools and uh, we have great organizations that support those breakfast programs and help us fund that and that's helping those kids to be successful in school. And the board knows that they, you need to have a process or a policy regarding poverty, that everybody isn't equal in Sault Ste. Marie. We wish they were, but yeah, yeah. the reality is that That's everybody right. is not equal. And we have a real, you know, a lot of pockets of need in the city. And so some of our schools are, are stretched a little more in this area. But, um, but you know, we do good work of equalizing that right. every day. So, right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, are we doing enough to fight poverty in Sault Ste. Marie? Well, I would love to see poverty eradicated in Sault Ste. Marie, but we all know that, you know, that's a, that's a, high, uh, that's a high goal. And so I think, you know, I think about fundraisers like we're doing around Coldest Night for St. Vincent right. Place and those sorts of things. It shows the community support. Like we had probably 230 walkers and we raised that much money. And so people from workplaces and uh, community groups, churches, all came together right. to, for the, to support that event. And so I think there's a lot of awareness and people are meeting needs around the city and there's just so many great um, organizations that are doing a lot of hard work every day to to try and support people great uh, let's talk in our remaining moments about cyber bullying this is an issue i keep hearing and because i people knew uh, that i was coming to interview you it's really concerning parents and i'm sure the board has a policy and is very um, knowledgeable that that uh, that's existing out there oh absolutely those are challenges in our community and you know across the across the country and certainly it's something we try to educate the, our children about. You know, we just had our pink shirt day, anti-bullying day, and the more awareness and the more yeah. stories that are told about students who've experienced bullying and we build empathy in our students, um, I think we can um, build a kinder, gentler world. Um, and unfortunately, the internet is a place where people can right. do things that they wouldn't do face to face. And, and so we're trying to educate our students on, um, you know, responsible use of the internet and, uh, and the damage that they can do through cyberbullying and things like that. So there's a lot of programs right. in, embedded in the curriculum um, to try and uh, understand the, the help our students understand the ramifications of what that can do and how it can affect right. our students yeah jen thank you so much for coming in when you're having fun the show I goes know. quickly imagine how right. fast <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much great thanks Take for having care. me and that's another edition of civic affairs i'm andy martins thanks for watching we'll see you next time As a nation, Canada has participated in all of the major world conflicts. In the Sioux area alone, over 10,000 men and women have enlisted in the Canadian Armed Forces. The Veterans Commemorative Monument aims to cement the legacy of the Canadian Armed Forces in stone. It will highlight the bravery, strength, courage and sacrifice of our service men and women. In times of need, they volunteered to serve us. Now it is our time to thank and recognize their sacrifice. You can help honor our men and women of service by donating today. To help construct this special, one-of-a-kind monument, visit thosewhoserve.ca to find out how to donate and more.